How are you, man? Awesome. This is so strange because they actually have a list of questions. I was going to say, you haven't taken notes. <laughs> well, I guess well, we could ramble and talk about a lot of cricket games. That <laughs> <laughs> Hi, it's Gus Wallen here and welcome to Not An Overnight Success. This is the first episode of a podcast series that I'm very, very proud to bring to you and I couldn't have first episode without it being my best friend in the whole world and someone that well I think everyone in the world actually knows and loves and of course that is Hugh Jackman. We couldn't have done this podcast series without our mates at Shaw and Partners Financial Services, Earl Evans, Alan Zion and of course Brittany Hughes. In this podcast series we sit down with some very successful people in the world of business, entertainment and sport and we chat to them about their life's journey and how they became the success that they are today. Okay, episode one, here we go. We are joined by my best mate, Hugh Jackman. A man that probably doesn't need much introduction. He's an Australian actor, singer, multi-instrumentalist, dancer, producer. You may have seen him in the odd film, The Wolverine, Swordfish, The Greatest Showman, La Miserables, which I thought was awesome, Australia, X-Men, just to name a few. He's won a Golden Globe Award, an Emmy, a Tony, and even a Grammy Award. But still, somehow, he maintains that persona of being one of the most humble and loved Australians in the world. And that is absolutely true. Hugh's success, however, did not come overnight. I met Jacko when I was five. Yep, that's right. I call him Jacko. I've never called him Hugh. We were in kindergarten together. and He's been my best mate for 48 years. He's the godfather of my child. I'm the godfather of his children. I was best man at his wedding. And I thought I knew everything about him until we sat down to do this interview where I learned so much more that was new to me. The biggest takeaway from this chat with Jacko, I suppose, was to trust your instincts, something that he has always done despite what the people around him advised. We talk about everything from our childhoods, his mum leaving, his dad's religious influence and how he entered into the acting world, his life in the limelight and who gets movie roles ahead of him. Shaw and Partners Financial Services have generously donated $10,000 to each guest charity of choice that feature on this podcast. We discuss who gets that money during the chat. The executive producer of this podcast is Keisha Pettit, and we couldn't have done it without our great mate, Kelly Stubbs. Let's get into the first episode of Not An Overnight Success. Here's Hugh Jackman. Big fella, thank you and welcome to the podcast. It's lovely to talk to you, brother. You too. He's awesome. Now, Jacko, what were you like as a kid? Give me an age, because I think I changed quite a lot. Give me an age. Okay, so I met you at five, and like all five-year-olds, we were pretty sort of happy-go-lucky. I think we were sort of happy kids. We were in a nice area at a nice school, and I suppose things changed for you, you know, a few years later than that. Yeah, I think I was very enthusiastic, always wanting to do a lot, being the youngest of five kids and with my older brothers and sisters, always doing stuff I wasn't allowed to do. I I was like chomping at the bit, like felt like I was being held back. I remember being at Aberfeldy on Eastern Road, like the preschool, and they said, you can go full day and not half day. I can still remember that. It's actually my first memory. That's how excited I was. Yeah, full day, and I want to catch the bus to school, and I want to go to school. It didn't take me that long to work out. That was not what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Super enthusiastic, pretty happy, and scared. I was a fearful kid. Like scared of the dark, scared of heights, scared of pain, scared. I was scared of a lot. Boogeyman. Yeah, quite. Yeah, scared. I don't remember you that way at all. You weren't there when I, when I quite famously was the first in our group to do the rock climbing. And I was terrified of rock climbing. Mm. But this was that we went to Camp Knox. So Gus, for those who don't know, Gus and I went to Knox. We had like an outdoor training camp thing that the school owned that you had to go to once a year or something. So I went to do that and I was the first to go up. And I remember going first because I was really scared about it. My brother told me I would have to do it. I was like, oh, halfway up, I froze. I just remember just gripping and I just couldn't get any more. And the guy's like, I better come down. I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. And I can hear the giggles from down below. I'm like, no, no, no. And then finally, of course, I had to get lowered down. Again, the giggles were getting louder and I started to cry. And I remember quite clearly saying, yeah, well, you just wait till you try it. It's really hard. You just wait. And then I went, and one by one, they just all in my group, not like not a problem, literally just like nothing. And I said to the guys, 
you have to let me do it again. I can't go back to the group. He goes, oh, sorry, we're out of time. The rope comes down. He packs up the rope. Help me pack up the rope. And I'm like, oh. And, and I think we were in fifth grade or something like that. But I do remember getting quite a lot of heckling all through the next year in, in Mr. Stewart's class. Yeah, well, you ready? You just try it. <laughs> <laughs> Kids can be brutal. I don't think you would have been one of those brutal heckling friends, though. No, absolutely. I wouldn't have been because I remember being in another group and doing it and struggling, but I did get there in the end. But I do remember how hard that was and how scary that was. But that didn't affect you too much, though, because that was fifth grade because we'd gone from Pimble Public School to Knox. And that was a big thing for us, a big change of school. We went from sort of the big fish to the little one to a certain degree. And a lot of blokes had been there for a long time. You know, they'd been there since kindy. So we were the new kids on the block. And you ended up being one of the leaders in year six. You ended up captaining Burns House. You were a leader pretty much within a year of joining Knox Prep. I don't remember it being hard at all. I remember chomping it a bit to go. I think, again, because all my brothers and sisters were now catching the bus and they were wearing the tie and the boater and all those things. And I want to do that. I want to do that. I want that. And, you know, you're my best friend. It was you and me. It wasn't like we were the only new ones. I don't know why fifth grade is a grade where you can send your kid to a private school. Like, it doesn't matter. The first four years, we're like, send her to the free one <laughs> and then fifth grade. But I just remember chomping the bit. I, I remember us leaving, holding hands together. Let's talk about that speech you made to the school one day to Burns House. Oh, no one had a mobile phone back then. That's just a career ender. Like, that's you get cancer before you get into sixth grade. Right? <laughs> what happened? I just... <laughs> So there was a point score, like an ongoing point score between the houses. And I don't know what the event was. Maybe it was the track and field or the swimming or something, but we'd come last and we were, we'd had a dramatic drop or something like that. And for some reason, I thought it'd be a good idea during our speech. So the, the house captains got to do a speech once a week. <laughs> I just thought it'd be a good idea to get out there and just look, not say anything, just shake my head in disgust <laughs> and just say, I can't even remember what I said, but it was something like, this is not even worth talking about. This is pathetic. And I turned my back and I went to sit down and I, that's my, but I remember people starting to giggle and people thinking, yeah, I think I misjudged that one pretty bad. <laughs> but I, then I sort of went on, I doubled down, I went into a big speech and this and that. That's not what Burns House is about. We're about full commitment. We're about this and there's kids in kindergarten in front of me. It's kindergarten. <laughs> It's five through 12. And the little kindergarten kids are like, well, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And then up to the sixth graders who are like, you're a complete knob. Like, <laughs> you're not an actual leader. Like, you've just been placed there. We're 11 years old. And I do remember you going, Jack, I, what was that about? And no one has ever really forgotten. That was a moment for sure. And I did have a quiet word to you that perhaps you were taking it all a bit too seriously. But, you know, it's one little blip, big fella, on a lot of stuff that was happening for you at the time. And I suppose we didn't all quite realise that your mum had left the family home when you were about eight. And, you know, there was a lot of pressure on you being the youngster and there was a lot going on in your life then. What do you remember of your mum leaving? I remember the morning very, very well. I guess it's one of those things that you must pick up. People often said to me things like, well, I could hear them saying, oh, well, he's only eight, he's too young. And I remember going, what are you talking about? I, I remember thinking, what are you talking about? I don't know exactly what's going on. Like, even though, of course, I didn't really know exactly. But I remember thinking, don't patronise me. I know what's going on. And I remember mum in, she had a towel around her head and a towel around her body as she was saying goodbye to us. The actual memory of that is fairly normal. Like we're lined up and we're going up to school, catching the bus. I was walking. I was at Pimble Public then. And yet somehow that memory stayed in there. So I must have picked that up. I must have sensed it. Or maybe when I got home trying to work out it was something different because there was the note from it. Actually, there wasn't. I didn't see the note until Dad got home. So when I got home that day, there was a few hours where I was, I was she was always there. Of course, this day she wasn't. She'd gone to England. Her mum was not well and she'd just gone. And I think we all thought, even mum included, that she was going to come back. But that just never happened. So I remember being really scared all of a sudden, scared in the house because I'd never really experienced that. And I don't know if I've ever told you this, but really for the next, till I was 15, till we did survival and had to be in the bush, 
Mm. I'm always scared going into the house on my own and after that day. So I would most of the time when we're at Murdoch Street, so I'm still at Pimble Public, just wait outside. I'd just wait outside in the backyard until someone got home because I was really frightened. And I was real, also, the other thing I remember was being embarrassed. I know it's a weird thing to say, but I, I remember people whispering because it was an unusual thing for a mother to leave the home. And I remember sort of looking and I, of course, I was really sad that she was gone, but I also remember going, oh, I can't stop people, stop talking about me. You know, that thing in school, where you just don't want to stand out. It was horrible, but I never thought it would last that long. I never thought it would be forever. I thought she would come back. I remember going down a couple of years later to Manly with you. I remember we were playing cricket behind some hotel and your mum was actually back in Australia. Yeah, and I think you were thinking very much that she's back and dad and mum are going to get back together again and we're going to get back to normal. I remember that. I don't know. Yeah, I remember that. So we were down in Manly because mum would come back and it was weird. We would go to Manly to be with her. So we stayed at the Eversham Hotel there for two or three weeks in January. So I would holiday in Sydney, which was sort of strange. But I actually really loved that time being with her and with all of us there together. And when I was 12, they announced they were going to reconcile with that didn't last very long. It actually never happened. It was like, I think dad went back. She, he came back alone. So that, that never, that was just a couple of week thing. But, and that's when I remember being really upset and angry. I remember being angry. You know, I was, well, you know me, I was never really in trouble a lot, but I was in trouble quite a lot in year seven around that time. Yeah. I remember telling a teacher there for often things you just didn't do in seven. I was just looking for <laughs> something to be angry about. That was really hard. Well, they gave you hope, didn't they? And then they took it away. And that's the hardest thing for anyone. And I remember at that stage, I suppose that's when we became even closer because you did spend a lot of time at our place and there was other places you stayed with as well for months at a time because back in the day your dad was a big deal and if you went overseas you went for months you didn't go and come back and go and come back you it was a huge journey so you stayed over there for a period of time i used to love staying at your place love we i mean it was like your best friend you're staying at your best friend's house we were like brothers but i hope you don't mind me talking about this and i've always felt bad to janelle your mum, because there was one time it would have been around that time when probably when it didn't work out with dad. Well, I was terrible at your place. I was angry. And I remember just seeing your mum with you, right? And it would just make me really angry. <laughs> I mean, of course it makes sense now, but one time I just lost it. And I had a go at her for her spaghetti bolognese, which was literally the best spaghetti bolognese you've ever had. And I think I said something like, well, my mum makes it better or something like that. And your mum was always like, okay, it's okay. But I was launching and you were, kind of, I remember you looking at me like, dude, like, what are you doing? Like, I remember this. I remember that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember. And it was something outside the front too. One day you were really angry and like, but it was so out of character. We knew it wasn't you. It was just, it was just you venting. I was jealous. I was jealous of you that you had that everyday sort of unconditional love and someone there and looking after you. And I was venting. I was completely venting. It was completely unfair. You must be like, Mum, can we ask? This guy's got to get on. He's out. <laughs> that wasn't ever the case because Mum understood, right? And then Mum, Mum said, hey, just leave him to me. And it was all, and it was only fleeting. It was an hour or two where you were just needed some time to just get whatever out you needed to get out. And Mum understood that. So. That was beautiful, but mate, the memories I have of us and our group of friends and what we got up to was just so special, you know, like it was incredible, wasn't it? We were so lucky to to have that group of mates and that school and all that came with it. Now I'm thinking about it on the driveway going into Knox, are you telling me about your parents? I remember yeah. you pulling me aside then yeah. and telling me about it, crying. And it's amazing. It's actually amazing when my kids sort of found out that we were friends since kindergarten and stayed not just friends but like best friends they had this kind of go that's kind of unbelievable <laughs> i mean we were lucky in that we always went to the same school but still there were 200 guys in our year and like let alone and we were super lucky and i i read this amazing book once by the guy who wrote freakonomics is a big sort of popular book and 
the, the headline of this chapter was, are your parents or your peer group more a predictor of your success in life? And his argument was peer group, ultimately. I mean, when he says success, he's talking about, I guess, the measurables, going to uni, having a job, I don't know. They said, like, that peer group when you're teenagers is so key. And right through to when we left school, when, you know, it was all the Banyana gang and all, all of that, and that group sort of extended, and we were very lucky. Absolutely. I wouldn't change anything. I absolutely wouldn't. And I remember telling you about mum and dad, and I was just like, well dad's left and you were just like so loving about it but it sort of made us bond even more I suppose because we did just have the one parent at home but your lifestyle at home with your dad who was who was just recently passed and and we love your dad but he was tough he was a tough taskmaster you know he did it the way he wanted to do it I know they want to come up to me and just say oh your dad and this and that and I ask every one of them I would say what was my dad like as a boss and Every single person, I'm not joking, it's like harsh but fair. <laughs> he was fair. He was harsh with everybody in the same. <laughs> he was. He was. Disciplined, black and white, like this is it. And thank God, a lot of it. I mean, you can imagine mum left when I was eight. So there were kids from eight, there was five, I was eight through 15. And we had a, a roster system where there's five kids, five days a week. So, you know, Monday nights was put the washing away but you had to do the dishwasher once a week you made the lunches once a week you cooked the dinner once a week you did all these things and you did them like you did them oh i remember going over to your place and on a sunday you'd have a treat right you'd have the sunday treat and i was just thinking okay well i get treats every day whenever i want them and here's jacko which is why you loved our place so much because you got treats all the time in the galant with a 20 cents worth of mixed lollies every afternoon like with a little surprise trip to Macca's on a Tuesday night. Like, <laughs> what is this like? This is, this is amazing. Do you know why Dad did the treat, by the way? No. So my dad would have a sweet or uh, like a Mars bar was awesome. But it could be minties, it, uh, non minties, like a pack of Tic Tacs. See, that's not a treat. No. He's like, listen, he would give us pocket money and uh, he said, I don't want you to spend your money on sweets. So I'm going to make sure you get sweets and I'll give it to you once a week. I'm like, <laughs> like us gets 20 cents. 20 cents when we were young, that's a big bag. A day. Good. <laughs> you know, my other favorite story about my dad, which I actually love, and we've talked about this all the time in terms of how to handle your finances. My dad would do pocket money and sit us down Around the end of summer every year, he had a ledger book. It looked like, a, you know, like an accountant's ledger's book. It would open up you and it'd have your year every year and every year your pocket money went up. Like everyone got exactly the same money depending on your age, no matter what. And let's say your pocket money is $2, right? Okay, Hugh, so we're going to break this down. That's 10% for the church. That's 20 cents. That's 10% for entertainment. Now I'm in my head going, what's entertainment? 10%. For clothing. And he would break it down from when we were five, six. Like if you want that special t shirt, put that 10 cents, that 20 cents, and you add it up. But here's the crazy thing. Let's say dad got to it on Australia Day, right? You would get a back pay for the difference from January 1. So if it went up to $3 or something like that, well, that's a dollar extra. And so, and he would make, so it was meticulous. It was accountancy like. Not one of my siblings I ever have ever been in debt. None of, us, none of us, all of us are just with money, no problem. Like he was very, just so methodical about it. Amazing. Let's talk about your dad just a little bit more around his faith because he became very much committed to his faith. A sort of middle-aged man, would you say, or was it earlier than that? I believe it was just before I was born. So he would have been late 20s, 30, something like that. I don't think his parents were religious at all. His father went to the war and was a real bomb vivant, like a real talk, a bit like my uncle, very outgoing, pub, loved to drink. And my dad, I think, went to, yeah, he went to a Billy Graham crusade, I think with my mum, when at that one that broke the record, uh, the attendance record of the SCG, with 60,000 mm -hmm. people, you know, and he was converted and that was it. So I only knew my dad as an incredibly religious man very religious. Everything we did socially, like, for example, we would have to observe the Sabbath, which meant on Sundays there was no work, 
no homework. I remember my brother Ian, when he was like in year 11 and 12, my brother Ian went on, for those who don't know, went on to be a Rhodes Scholar. Like he came second in the state in HSC and he was, I remember him yelling at my dad, like having an argument, wanting to do homework on a Sunday because he's got his HSC. My brother like, no, like there was not many households like that. Mm. Our holidays, we went to Blue Mountains to the Church Missionary Society. So our whole life outside of school, well, I wasn't with you, was the church life, which actually, considering we went to an all boys school, a lot of girls here at church. It was kind of great. Like that was a good social life as well. I know you're not particularly religious. Why did you not necessarily jump on board like your dad? I really did. I don't know if you remember, but when 13, 14, 15, maybe 13, 14, I was super religious. You remember me giving a sermon at school? No. Our minister was away and they said, we're looking for people to give a sermon. I guess I was like that. And as I walked out, Cameron was all heckling me like, you're such a knob. <laughs> and I was re- it really, really mattered to me. Like I was super into it. I think it gave me a lot of structure, particularly after mum left, particularly after mum didn't come back when I was 12. I was really into it then. Just this idea that someone is there, you can pray to at any time, and they're always there and always listening and has your back no matter what. You can hand over your problems. If you make a mistake, you can get forgiven, all of that. And I think around 15, 16, I was like, just the intellectual side of it was too many questions coming up that couldn't be answered for me. Hang on, so only the Christians going to heaven, and it's only these particular Christians. So... All those Buddhists and all that was like, hang on. So if you're born, and I would ask those questions, they said, well, God will figure that out. And I was like, something feels weird about this. And so I still started questioning it more and more, but I didn't never really let it go. And actually, I think what Dad Dylan still in me and what the church and that search instilled in me is that there is something bigger than ourselves and a meaning to life beyond just Hugh or beyond just Gus or my family somebody to connect to some purpose there i think i've always still looked for that so yeah but the actual christian i'm probably more a universalist oscar my son always i'm probably i feel there's probably a, there's an element of truth to all those major religions i don't think if you put jesus and muhammad or socrates or shakespeare or any of these sort of buddha if you put them at a dinner table i don't think they're arguing i think they're all just going yeah it's all the same thing pretty much just in a yeah. different I've always thought there's something better off. I'm not quite sure what it is, but just be good down here and you might get a good spot at the table upstairs and never really thought too much more about it than that. Really? Jacko, I think everyone would be interested in knowing how you became the man you are now in terms of being the entertainer. And the fact is that we always played parts in school musicals. We enjoyed performing and that sort of stuff at school. But at what point that you had that conversation with your dad and he said, go and get yourself a proper degree, then you can go and do your acting. Can you talk us through that and then obviously going across to Whopper and realising that you might be able to make a go at it? I'll just give you a little side story because, I, again, I don't know if I've told you this or anyone this, but my dad used to take us to, I guess, like revival meeting, like there were Friday night, there was rock music, a bit like sort of hill song, that kind of thing. And we were at Karingai High School and we were in there and people were invited to come up and get saved. It was a very sort of upbeat thing. And the guy who was speaking was incredibly dynamic. And I had this unbelievably strong, I would have been 14, 15. I just knew that I was going to be on stage. Like it just came like a boom. I'm going to do that. So actually at the time, I thought that meant I'm going to be a minister. So when I was about 14, I thought that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be that guy. I knew I was going to be up there with a lot of people around and all of that. So I always carried that within me because I, you never forget a moment like that. But I sort of forgot about it. We did musicals. I went off. We had a gap year. I went to uni. I did communications at UTS. And a sort of quirk of fate put me in a theatre class. And then for the first time in the theatre class history, they decided to do a play. And I got cast as the lead, which I begged him to get me out of because I didn't have time. And <laughs> that. And we ended up doing the play, taking it to okay. Uni and Armadale. And they did okay. it. They had a half communications, half theatre program. And we were getting billeted. And I walked in to the house where I was being billeted by. And I was like, oh, I've just wasted three years. I, this, I should have been doing this. This is what I meant to do. So I then went off and studied. 
at the Actors Center for one year. Ended up getting an audition and getting the role for Neighbours the same weekend that I found out, I auditioned and found out I got a spot at Whopper. And I went to my dad because I didn't know what to do. I was like, oh, Neighbours. And it was a thing. It was $2,000 a week. It was a two-year contract. It was Neighbours at the height of Neighbours. Mate, I remember you ringing me. I was in England. I remember taking the phone call at the Fountain Inn and you said, I've got a job on Neighbours or there's this other course I can do called Whopper. I said, Whopper what? Like, what are you talking about? You've got to do Neighbours. And you, for the first time, went against me correctly. And it hasn't been the only time you've gone against me incorrectly. And you decided to, to go to Whopper. And I went, I told my dad this guy, I said, Dad, I don't know what to do. And he said, I can't answer that for you. I think you have to make that choice yourself. And by the end of the weekend, it was just clear to me because I wanted to be able to, at this point, I was so into acting. I wanted to do the National Theatre in London, Royal Shakespeare Company, whatever came my way. And I thought, well, being on Neighbours make me feel I deserve to be the Royal Shakespeare Company or the Sydney Theatre Company. No, the answer was probably no. So I decided to go and I said that. To my dad, I'm going to go. I'd said, how do you feel about me being an actor? And he said, well, I think you have the talent, but I think you're too thin-skinned. Did I ever tell you that one? Yeah, you did tell me that, yeah. yeah. So he was right. I'm, I am thin-skinned. But I actually weirdly think that that's sort of, that sensitivity is probably necessary in a way. I know he was very proud of you when you did start performing and so forth. I was sitting in many places with him and saw him just the biggest smile on his face. That must have made you feel really proud that you were out there doing it. I remember in my uh, last play at Whopper and I was playing Romeo and Romeo and Juliet and we did this thing where the house lights were up the whole time. So you could see the audience. So our job, Shakespeare and all those sort of soliloquies talked to the audience and I remember looking out my dad was like row eight and I was doing a scene where I've been banished and I've been banished and I'm crying and I look out. And I, you know, how many times my dad cried when we were young, like never. So I saw that picture so many times. When I hosted the Oscars, I could see him just crying, just that pride. I remember when Ralph handed over the, he was vice captain at Knox, we were at the Sydney Opera House and I was becoming school captain and John Wall, we did that sort of handshake thing and I could see my dad crying again. like. Mm. He was lovely, never said a bad word. He was not the, mm, why did you choose that? Or what's this about? Or just always like, good job, wonderful, you know. So great. Just quickly interrupting the episode to say a very big thank you to the sponsor of this podcast, and that is Shore and Partners Financial Services. Shore and Partners are an Australian investment and wealth management firm who manage over $28 billion of assets under advice. With seven offices across Australia, Shore and Partners act for and on behalf of individuals, institutions, corporates, and charities. For more info, you can check out their website at shoreandpartners.com.au. That's S H A W for sure. Shore and Partners Financial Services, your partners in building and preserving wealth. Now let's get back into the episode. Let's talk about your first professional job, I suppose. You know, your first TV role was a pretty important one for you for a few different reasons. Firstly, you missed my wedding because of it, which I've never quite ever forgiven. There's a couple of things I haven't forgiven you for. That's (laughs) the second of them. But you ended up meeting someone very, very special on your first day. And I remember you saying to me, oh, this leading lady, she's wonderful, she's this and that. And you would fall in love with every leading lady that you'd ever, from Belinda Wilson on My Fair Lady in, in year 11 all the way through. Talent crushes so easily. I was worried about you, but this one has stood the test of time. Deb is the love of your life and someone that you just adore and love. Talk us through that. I auditioned for it, this show called Corelli, an ABC series. I was in third year of drama and I was doing that Romeo and Juliet and the quirk of that Romeo and Juliet was you found out two weeks before the opening night what you were doing and what role you were playing so you had two weeks to rehearse it to learn it you you couldn't know before so I was in the middle of that and they said we're doing an audition it's like a standard audition every graduate gets auditioned by the ABC they gave you three pages it was some prison thing and I was like everyone knew it was a crock like this was a waste of time just something they had to do at the ABC and so I went in, I did the audition and walked out, never thought about it again. A week later, the head of the school pulled me out of class and said, Hugh, you're the top of the short list for that ABC series. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, that audition. I said, no, that was just a general for the ABC. Like, for anything, he goes, no, they were looking for someone for, that, for a prison drama. I'm like, 
so then they said, and you're going to go do the callback in two weeks' time when you're in Melbourne and they're all going to be there, the semicircle of people, and you're going to do the audition again. I don't think I slept for two weeks. <laughs> it was just horrible, two weeks waiting for that. This is the luckiest break I have in my life. I finished the showcase. I was in Melbourne thinking I was going in the next day to do the audition. And my agent said, by the way, they, they had a look again. They're just super happy. They're going to cast you. They don't need, they don't need that. I was like, oh. <laughs> because I knew I would have blown it. I was so nervous. And at the first audition, I really didn't care. So it was perfect. So I walk in. The very first day I got picked up to go to set and the lead actress, Deborah Lee Finesse, was in the front seat of the car. And first of all, I thought, well, that's a good sign because I knew she'd done Hollywood movies and I had this thing, oh, Hollywood, and everyone sits in the back being chauffeur driven. It was the second I did pick this up and she turned around. She would like put her knees on the front seat of the, uh, of the front seat and she took off her sunglasses. She stuck out and she goes, hi, Hugh Jackman, I'm Deborah Lee, like that. And I just took it and I was like, oh, I like this. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. No, I didn't think. I mean, the show, I was so nervous. She was in every single scene, like working so hard. But we just went like instantly best mates. We would hang out. Never crossed my mind, actually. But never even crossed my mind I had a crush on her until it did. And when I realized I had a crush on her about two months in, I was so embarrassed because everyone had a crush on Deb. And she was the leader thing, literally everyone. So I, was, I didn't talk to her for a week. And finally at a dinner party, and I thought, I, I better invite her to this dinner party. This is just embarrassing. I don't know what to do. So I invited her and she said, why aren't you talking to me? What's going on? Have I done something to annoy you? And I said, oh, babe, sorry, I've got a crush on you. I'll get over it. I'll get over it. I didn't say babe. I said dead. Yeah. <laughs> and she goes, oh, really? I went, yeah, sorry. And she goes, yeah, i got one on you too. And I'm like, right, sorry, what? <laughs> Then I'm like, I think that was the invitation to kiss it. Missed it. Gone. Trains left oh. the station. Gone. Just then trying to shimmy it back into a realm. <laughs> you always missed it, but you all, like you were always handsome. You were always loved by everyone, and you continually played and missed outside the off stump. You just did not take the hint. No, not good. Terrible. So we <laughs> thought we were keeping it a secret, by the way, on set. Of course, later we found out that literally everybody knew. But the moment we knew everybody didn't know is we were doing a scene together and we leaned across the table and we were just sort of chatting. And it was one of those chats of when we finish work tonight, when we get home, this is how it's going to go. And both Deb was telling me that. And I remember seeing something a little furry out of the corner of my eye and I'm like, the boom mic. And Deb oh. looked at it and the boom mic went to the boom which went to the guy with the headphones who's just looking away smiling and you're <laughs> at abc studio so it doesn't just go to the sound recorder so it goes to the central abc whatever sound mixer i'm like all right Deb, it looks like it's out we're done oh that's so awesome i remember you telling me that you'd never felt quite like this before and you weren't worried about the age gap that's the first thing that everyone comes and hits me with because people that don't know you guys together don't have a clue, you know. Did that ever come across your mind that there was an age gap? You were so much younger. That was the amazing thing. I totally understand why people go, what? Because I would have been like that too if someone else. But first of all, if you meet Deb, <laughs> I'm very much more the more yeah. older, boring, yeah. mature one. So I'm. she's still like a little kid. And yeah, that was sort of like from the beginning. However, forgetting that, it never bothered me for a second. I was just so, when I say in love, infatuated, I, I wasn't infatuated, I was in love. I doubted it for a second because I'd never felt anything like that, that I thought I'm going to wait six months. I'm just going to wait. I knew I wanted to marry it like two weeks in, but of course my history of just falling in love, I was like, I'm going <laughs> yeah. to wait. And then it just became every day clearer and clearer and clearer. In fact, I remember three weeks in, we were at a dinner party and I knew just the way she was behaving that she was working out ways to break up with me. I could just tell. And I also knew that same moment, it was because I represent, I was a young actor on his first job. And she'd always said, even before we were together, she could see where things were going for me. I couldn't obviously, but, and I think she was like, I don't know if I want to be signed up for this, you know? And I said, are you trying to, on the drive home, I said, are you, uh, 
are you working out reasons in your head to break up with me? And she looked at me and she goes, yeah. And I said, no, I get it. I said, I understand that. This is probably a pretty scary situation, but I think you just have to get over that because I think we're going to be together. And even as it came out, I was like, that's not me. Well, you know me. No, I was normally like, oh, shit. If she's going to dump me, I'll dump, I'm going to run first. I didn't want to be left like that, but I just knew. Uh, and so I'm circling back to the age thing. It literally just went away. In the same way, literally it's exactly like if you said, well, I like brunettes. I only like brunettes. Or I only like tall women. Or I only like blah, blah, blah. Or I only like this. And then you meet someone who's the opposite of what you said you like. And then you just go, blah, blah, love this even more. Like it was yeah. like that. And so the number meant nothing. It really does. Well, I certainly know that. And I certainly know you are the old boring one compared to Deb. If they've known me or met me, even if they're fans of mine, it's always like, don't get me wrong, you're great, but your wife. Yeah. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> so, Jacko, let's talk about the kids for a moment because you've adopted two beautiful kids. Oscar's my godson, your first, and then Ava a few years later. What was that whole thing like for you and Deb going through trying to have your own and then adopting? And obviously, I think Deb should be Australian of the Year for what she has done for adoption in this country and around the world. But what was that whole process like for you? So the age Deb was when we met, we were like, let's just get to it. Let's go. And so we tried. And what was really hard was we had two, certainly maybe three, like one we weren't 100% sure, miscarriages. We had two certainly carried long enough where your hopes were up and and that was really, really hard. I remember at the time there was a horrible picture of Deb, like it was just the angle was wrong and we just found out that the baby hadn't carried and we had miscarriage and but it was like, is Deb hiding something under her? Like, is she pregnant? And it came out and everyone's sending this, oh, is it true? And just when we, the night before, she'd been in tears and, so this is just so hard and to do that publicly that was really hard and deb i'm more philosophical like i knew i was meant to be i just knew i was meant to be with deb in the same way i knew when i was 14 that i was going to be on stage i some, there's a few things i've known very clearly so however it happened whatever happened i knew that that was the path we were meant to be on but deb was is very much a you make things happen if you want to make them happen and so this was the first time, I think, for her where something she'd really wanted just wasn't happening. And that was really, it was hard, really hard. I actually was the one who said, because we did rounds of IVF as well. And anyone who's been through that knows that it's just exciting in one way to have that opportunity, but it's really difficult for the woman, the hormones and the treatment and the hopes that you get up. And it's hard. I think we did four rounds of that, maybe five rounds of that. And finally, I just said, but let's just adopt, which is something we'd always talked about doing. So I don't know why. I'm trying to remember why the other day. Like, but Deb and I, from the beginning, had talked about having a mixture of adopted and biological kids if we were lucky enough to have it. Maybe it was because, you know, our other friends, the Rawstorns, had that same situation. The, a family that I spent time with when we were growing up had that situation. But it felt right to both of us. So we then just went down the path of adoption. I was like, Deb, let's just do that. I think let's just concentrate on that because it was too hard for me to watch her going through all that. Mm. And then we tried to do it in Australia and it was just brutal. It was brutally hard at the time and it was actually discouraging. Like we went to that first night. It was neg very negative. We really got the sense that they were trying to put people off, like deliberately, like there's not many, this is going to be hard and, you, you know, are you sure? And so we actually went for the meeting with the person and the first thing the person said and we were in melbourne and she said don't think because you're famous you're going to get special treatment that was the first thing i was like wow i mean deb was famous i was not really but we were like oh, this just feels weird so luckily deb had a green card we had the option of adopting through america which was just a much easier situation and then deb's dedicated maybe 20 years of her life now to highlighting those issues and making it better for people. I remember, Jacko, when you said that uh, Oscar was going to turn into a Jackman and, and we flew over and, you know, we held him and the beautiful lady judge and and he became a Oscar Jackman. I remember that 
day so well. It was a very emotional day for everyone because you were, I think you just finished Swordfish. Yeah, we just finished Swordfish and he was about one, one and something like that. And so we were doing the official papers and we went into that courtroom. Yeah. And I don't know, there's something about courtrooms that's still very formal. You don't know how to act. And of course, there were cases before ours and it was all very serious and people coming in with serious things going on. And oh, okay, so Oscar Jackman and yeah, we're there. She's the loveliest lady. Yeah, and Oscar's holding the gavel and we're just mucking around. We're taking photos. And she's like, and she's, remember she said, oh, this is the best thing that's happened to me all week. Like she just yeah. loved seeing a family come together. And then when it, what I liked also is when it came to the thing and she did, gave it a little bit of a formal ring to it. Like it was just awesome. And Oscar was crawling around on the desk. <laughs> She was the perfect age, that, that grandmothery age of hers, you know. She was just perfect and it was so lovely. Vix and I remember it so well. Do we have Beautiful. time to tell about our little side trip that we took to Vegas? Yeah, we do. Go for it. <laughs> Not, don't, don't say everything. My godson, Jack, <laughs> you were there, so we all went on a road trip. I think I just finished the film. We went on a road trip to Vegas. Yeah. And we are walking and... What obviously none of us knew, but we worked out pretty quickly, was it was the annual porn awards that were yeah. being held in the same hotel that we were staying in. And you, all of us must have just looked like complete out of town hick. We were like, what's going on? Like it was, <laughs> and being in the elevator with these people, just, oh, hi, Bill. This is my husband. Oh, we worked together on a film. You're he's such a professional. He's like, oh, lovely to meet you. We're just like, <laughs> Shaking hands. Oh, yeah, she had a great time in the film. And I'm like, wow. And I remember them wanting to have photos and stuff with you. And it was just really good fun. That was a great trip to Vegas. Only a couple of nights, but it was so awesome. But let's talk about some of the big things that have happened in your life. So if we fast forward and say that you, you start doing movies and so forth, hosting the Academy Awards, winning Tony Awards, you know, having those nights where you can only dream of what's that been like for you i'm really glad that i said yes to a lot of things even things that scared me my, my instinct was always like for example the oscars just say yes and then of course i doubted it and i remember just before i went on stage of going into a hole like i'm like what am i doing and they're like 40 seconds 30 seconds and i'm like why did i say yes i'm not billy crystal i'm not even close to billy crystal I'm not even the funniest guy in my group at high school, let alone why am I <laughs> doing this? Right. And I remember Valdez, who's been there for 26 years, saying, Good luck, Mr. Jackman. Right. I said nothing. He goes, and uh, don't worry, mate, it's only a billion people watching on telly. And I look <laughs> up and I started laughing. And that saved me. But I'm really, same thing again, like with the Tony Awards or, or the things that I've ultimately I've never lost sight of the fact that I'm a kid from the northern suburbs of Sydney and I never wanted to be lying on my deathbed as an old man going, oh, I wish I just said yes to that. Like, I, I, Even if it didn't work out to say yes. And most of the time that has really worked in my favour and I've had some incredible experiences. I hope I have so many more, but I, I feel super lucky like being on a set with Travolta, you name it, all the people I've got to work with, uh, the directors I've got to work with is still shocking to me and amazing to me and it's been full of surprises, full of them. A lot of famous people have this sort of syndrome the, of where you think any moment now someone's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, thanks, mate, it's been fun but you've got to go. Have you ever had that sort of syndrome of just feeling like, oh, someone's going to take over this soon because I'm not good enough? Uh, yeah. Probably all the time. And I don't think there's many people I know who don't have some version of that because in some ways, I'm not going to say who, but a girl I went to drama school with at, at the Actors Centre, 15 years later, my career is sort of already going. She had a few drinks. It was a lunch thing. And she pulled me. She goes, you yeah, I just got to say, like, I can't, like, good for you, but why you? Like, I mean, <laughs> and it was sort of actually a bit rude. But she didn't mean it to be rude. She was just kind of going, you didn't stand out. Like it wasn't meant to be. And I think that feeling is something that I feel within. Like just before I go to the Oscars and I'm like, why am I hosting the Oscars or hosting the Tony Awards or why am I in this movie called Australia with Nicole Kim? Somebody at some point is going to go like, good effort, man. Like when you're not a bad guy and all that. 
but you're not that good. Like, really, there's a bunch of other people out there. And I often think that. I go, oh, no, I could think of a bunch of other people who are better at this than me. So then I think it drives me in a way. And I think I'm learning to not let it take the fun away. I, if I'm honest, I think it's taken some of the fun away of the moment. If I can liken it to sport, I wish that when I was in the Super Bowl of, what, of my career, that I'm there in the game going, this is amazing. But a lot of the time in the middle of it, it's like, don't screw this up, don't screw this, this is the Super Bowl, don't screw this up, oh, that's going okay, but don't screw it up, and it's okay. And then finally it gets to the end and you go, okay, I went all right, or damn, I should have done better. I don't know, a lot of people have it, but I'm getting better at learning to just trust, I think, and have faith and to enjoy it. I think, Jacko, when we see you on stage, and I've been fortunate enough to see you nearly everywhere, New York next year, you don't look like you're not enjoying it. You actually look like you're having a ball. When you're singing and dancing, when you're doing stuff in The Greatest Showman, you look absolutely at ease. So is that you holding it together but inside feeling that imposter syndrome or is that more the truth? I sometimes feel it, certainly with the dancing. I mean, every show I've been in, every single dancer in the show is better than me. But I feel on stage, you know, that thing we always talk about in sport where you go, it looks like that, like Jeff Thompson is bowling medium pace. It just got so much time. I have that feeling on stage. I have that feeling of, oh, I've got time. I can work. It feels like there's space around me. It's taken me a lot longer with film to feel that. And so on stage in general, I could think sometimes I'm even more, I'm as relaxed as I am now talking to you when I'm on stage. And yeah. I think that goes back to that feeling I had when I was 14 and I just knew on my bones I was meant to be there. I think that's certainly my sweet spot and I feel less of the imposter syndrome. Although if you ask me to describe how I do it or why, I, I don't know. That's still a bit of a mystery to me. Yeah. You look like Mark War when you're on stage. You look like Steve War in a movie. That's a good way of describing it, I reckon. <laughs> That's so good. Oh, but if my average was as good as Steve War's, my average was probably, I'd be Leonardo DiCaprio. Let's go. Yeah. Well, that was the other question. Let's do a few more quick fire ones because you do rabbit on a bit with your answers. I do, but um, you can edit it. Yeah. <laughs> So there must be a pecking order, right? So when let's say I've got $150 million and I want to do this super-duper movie. So Leonardo, Brad Pitt, George Clooney, yourself, Ryan Reynolds, Tom Hanks. There's a list of super-duper actors and whatever. Where do you sit? Like how many people say no before you get the Guernsey? Oh, a solid three, I would say. Say no, but it's become more... Leo, I think, is probably one of the only ones that it doesn't matter what type of film he's doing, it's making $100 million. For me, if it's a musical, I might be right up there, actually. You know, if it's a musical, if it's something close to a Wolverine where people go, oh, that like him in that sort of thing, weirdly, because you know how different that is from me. Yeah. But in that, I'm, I'm up there. But once you get into action, you, you go to The Rock, you go to Vin Diesel, you go to Jason Statham, there's a bunch of... Brad, so I guess in movies, I, I feel I'm somewhere between five to 10, somewhere in there. Mm. I feel I'm in the top 11, but I'm not getting the commercial. They're not picking me for the commercial for the team. Yeah, gotcha. It's cool, though. I love that. I love there's a peck and order. When you want to go out to dinner, do you make the booking? And can you say, hey, it's Hugh Jackman here, and you get a booking? Yes. <laughs> How good does that feel? That is so good, particularly in New York City. That is really good. When you so call up 6.30, I have to tell you, when we got off the plane, it was paparazzi in Australia. We just come from New York and there's paparazzi chasing us all the way down. I'm like, oh, sorry, Ava, it's just annoying. She was standing next to me. She goes, that we just flew first class on Qantas from New York to Sydney for 24 hours. This is fine. <laughs> we love Ava. She's so gorgeous. Do you go for roles because of the pay that it's attached or are you attracted to other things that, like the director, the producer, the character and the script? Writer, director, script, character, you know, I'm lucky enough, done well. So I don't have to do it on that. But sometimes I will think I would like to still stay relevant in the game. You know, if there's a really good movie that I think that a lot of people will like, I'll still want to have the best director and script. How does the business side of movies uh, work? Do you get offered a certain amount or is it based on how well the movie goes? Uh, yeah, no, they take a bet on you. So depending on 
what they think the movie is. If it's like an X-Men Marvel type movie and I'm in it, they feel they're taking a guess, well, I think it'll make this amount so we can allocate this much. Or Then the metric is more, what do we lose if we don't have him? So then that's how they go, well, if he's in it, it's going to make that much more, you know? I love that. You've starred in so much stuff, Jacko. Is there one particular role that has changed you as a person? Hmm. Good question. I think I changed a lot on this last one. A lot happened on this last one. It's called The Sun. It was a very intense script. My father passed away during it, which made it even more intense. And I think I was doing a lot of work. It just sort of brought a lot of stuff up. I don't know whether it did or I just changed during it. Because of it, I'm not sure. Clean Boy from Oz, I did change quite a lot doing Peter Allen on stage on Broadway. I learned a lot from that. I learned to trust my instincts a bit. It is con- it's, it's a feeling of constantly learning as you go with every part, to be honest, even the ones that don't work out. Beautiful. Meditation, a huge part of your life. I've only just cracked onto it. You're doing it for 25 years. How important is meditation to you and how often do you do it? I found it when I was 23. So uh, Transcendental Meditation TM. And it really changed things for me back then. I, I think I was just being very reactive to life. Well, this, we go that. And then I was like, oh, there's a kind of stillness and a peace below that. I do it at least once a day every day. Um, when I'm working, I'll do it twice a day. I remember sitting with you, I think it was on Swordfish, I'm not sure, in your trailer and you said, I just need 10 minutes. And you put your legs up and you lay on the ground and you sat in silence for about 10 minutes and you woke up. And you said that was nearly as good as a full night's sleep for you. That's how deep you got. And I remember thinking, how cool would that be to be able to get yourself into that space? Jerry Seinfeld said the same, actually. We do the same type of meditation when he was doing Seinfeld. Every lunch, when everyone was going to have lunch or do their thing or make their phone calls, he would meditate. And he said, I could see my energy in the second half of the day where everyone else was flagging. It's sort of, it's a real, it's a reset. What's the personality trait about yourself that you like? What's the thing you like most about yourself? I'm curious. I'm, I'm always wanting to learn. Yeah, I love that. And I, I also think you're incredibly loyal yep. and honest. I think you're pretty honest too. I think, what about a trait that you don't like about yourself? I think I'm still too much of a people pleaser, trying to be all things to all people. We're working on that, aren't we, brother? <laughs> Was there a moment, just that one moment where you went, I've made it? And did you celebrate that moment? Because I've spoken to a lot of famous people on these podcasts and very rarely do famous, happy, successful people actually stop and smell the roses and say, oh, this is what it's all about. They just go to the next mountain. I go to the next one mountain. (laughs) I think there was a slight moment after I had a good couple of back-to-backs with Logan and The Greatest Showman. And also the the way they both sort of succeeded sort of against – all odds and all that sort of thing, particularly showman. I remember thinking, not that I've made it because I'm still, but I remember thinking, oh, you can't take that away from me. Like, you know what I mean? I don't, does that make sense? Yeah. It's like, oh, that's something that I'll always have. You know? Oh, that showman was just unreal. I just remember, remember going to the opening, remember that we were there together and all our mates were there and all the kids were there. It was incredible. Actually, Fox put on that party for us at the end. I mean, I know it was a cast party, but then Zendaya was there and Zach came up, but literally it was a hundred of all my buddies and their kids, and it was so much fun. It was fantastic, mate. It was one of those really great nights, and it was in Sydney as well. So That was a good celebration moment because you guys have come to a bunch of premieres where there was a lot of not let's not talk about the movie afterwards. <laughs> Well, you'll know you'll always get the truth from us, won't you? A hundred (laughs) percent. Okay, Jacko, let me finish this podcast off and it's been beautiful. We could literally talk forever, but we've got the top five or a fast five questions to finish. So your favourite holiday destination? Byron Bay. Beautiful. How good was that trip? Was that your 35th we went there? Yeah, 35th. We went hang gliding. That's right. Never forgive you for that. Favourite quote, is there one that you live by? A life lived in fear is a life half lived. Yeah, nice. Favourite movie? Singing in the Rain. Oh, what about your favourite movie that you were in? Mm, can't, can't give you that. I mean, literally it's probably three or four and I just always pick them apart anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Favourite book? Because I know how much you read, especially you're reading a lot at the moment. What's your favourite book? Siddhartha. 
by Herman Hess. What's that about? It's about the Buddha, but it's about his journey from being a prince to becoming on his spiritual journey. And I read that when I was about 18, and I've reread it probably every five years. It's a short book. Okay. So we're going to say, oh, really? Oh, good. I'll read it. You're like, no. Has it got pictures? I'll put some pictures in. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just randomly throw some cricket pictures in there for you. That'd be perfect. Thank you. I am reading at the moment The Second Mountain, which you asked me to buy, and some evolution one about stripping down success and stuff. I got that up by the loo. So there's two books that I'm reading at the moment. They're both suggestions from yourself. So Nice. Your favourite charity. I know there's so many that you love and support and Deb loves and support, but who would you like to give the $10,000 to from Shore and Partners? I'm going to give it to Gotcha for Life. It is honestly one of my favorite charities and it's not just because you conceived it and founded it and are running it. I'm actually really interested in philanthropic work that makes a massive difference. That's not about money, it's about tools, simple tools to make our life better, to make our community stronger and richer and to make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. I mean, we say that all the time, you're only as happy as your unhappiest kid, right? And if we just broaden that out from our husband, wife and two kids or whatever it is, our, our nuclear family, if we just started to think of our community, even our best friends, all that as our family. And if we were really just supporting those people, how much better we'd all be. And, and I think that's what I love what Gotcha is doing. It's just so practical. A lot of people out there talking about mental health, but I think you guys are doing your best in really giving practical tools for people to make all our lives better. Thank you, Jacko. Yeah, the village scenario you're talking about there is as simple as it can be, right? Write down the list of the people you love and adore you can't imagine living without, well, and then go to work to make sure that they don't worry alone and that way you're looking after your village. And Because if you look at the problem as a world's problem, it's probably too big for most people to, to deal with. But, you know, I love the fact that you're so committed to gotcha and you understand what I go through and the emotions and you're my gotcha for life friend that I can ring up and say, hey, this is all going to be too much for me. You know, what do you reckon? And you give me good counsel or... Yeah, but our friendship's got better since you started this work because actually all of us need tuning up on that. Yeah, that's true, brother. Well, thank you so much for your time on Not An Overnight Success. You are certainly that. You work very hard for what you've got and you deserve every bit. What I love about you and a little story I heard was when the Americans were saying there's too many foreigners in this country and we've got to get rid of them. And they were like, yeah, we're going to get rid of, you know, four or five actors from different nationalities, English, European And we've got to get rid of that Russell Crowe. He's got to go. And then someone said, oh, what about Hugh Jackman? They went, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're not getting rid of Hugh Jackman. Everyone looked in the committee nods and said, no, we can keep Hugh Jackman. So they chucked everyone else out, but they kept you. And it was, I've seen you over the years be in very uncomfortable situations where people are just at you all the time and you never lose your shit. You're always continually calm and modest and kind. And that's who you are. And I'm very, 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 very proud to call you my best friend. So thank you for joining us today brother and i love you i back at you love you too man well that was nice to get the first one away and to do it with my best friend was really extra special and i must admit i sat here listening to him thinking i haven't heard this story before and i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did Uh, coming up on the next episode of the podcast is one of australia's most successful real estate agents his name is gavin rubenstein in this interview we talk a lot about the passion and drive that fuels gavin the athlete-like dedication and love of the competition He really has an interesting perspective on delegation and playing to your strength. A big thank you to Shaw and Partners Financial Services who have generously supported this podcast and also donated $10,000 to the charity of choice of each of our guests to thank them for their time. Shaw and Partners are an Australian investment and wealth management firm who manage over $28 billion of assets under advice. With seven offices around Australia, Shaw and Partners act for and on behalf of individuals, institutions, corporates and charities. For more info, you can check out their website at shawandpartners.com.au. That's S-H-A-W for sure. Shaw and Partners Financial Services, your partners in building and preserving wealth.